Now, uh, we come back to how do you test for BCNF? So given a relation, how do you test for BCNF? So we will take each dependency. Um, if, if I have a particular dependency, alpha goes to beta, it's very easy to check if it violates BCNF. Compute alpha plus, and if it contains all attributes, it's fine. If it does not contain anything other than itself, it's trivial, that's fine. But if it contains any attribute other than itself, but is not as everything, then you know it's a violation. So now, if I'm given a particular relation R, a schema R, it's not decomposed at this point, just I'm given something, and I'm given a set of functional dependencies on that one schema. Now, if I want to check if this satisfies BCNF or not, I can actually uh, just do the following. I take each dependency in F, apply the previous test. That is, I take each dependency, say alpha goes to beta, compute alpha plus, and that will tell me, uh, using the previous test, whether alpha goes to beta shows that this violates BCNF. So if I just do this for all the given dependencies, I can check if um, R violates BCNF or not. That seems like a very easy, very cheap test for BCNF. Looks very uh, enticing, you know. It's correct, actually, as far as this goes. The problem which happens is, what if you decompose R? Then how do you check for violation of BCNF for the decomposed relations? So if I decompose R, then I look at a particular uh, relation in the decomposition. Supposing I try to apply this test, I'll take the given set of dependencies F, and on that particular relation R in the decomposition, I will apply this test, alpha plus, and see if it's the super key or not. Unfortunately, uh, it, this test doesn't work. So let's take this example. R is A, B, C, D, E, and the dependency set is A goes to B, B, C goes to D. Okay, simple pair. And we can decompose this into A, B, and A, C, D, E by using the first uh, dependency here. Now, if you look at um, uh, this thing here, the first one, the only dependency is A goes to B. This is, in fact, in B, C, N, F. In fact, any uh, binary relation will be in BCNF. If there is a dependency at all, one determines the other, it's going to be a super key, trivially. So any binary relation is in BCNF. We don't have to bother testing it. The other one, ACDE, how do we know whether it's in BCNF or not? If we use this given set of dependencies, A goes to B. B is, um, you know, if I compute the closure here, uh, what do I get? If I um, if I just take closure of A, does it contain anything other than A? It has B, but B is not in this, so it's irrelevant. So I'll say the closure of A is only A, so it's, we can ignore that. How about closure of BC? B is not even here, so I cannot do anything with BC, so that's useless for this one. So if I just use these two dependencies and try to do the closure and test it, I might think that ACD is in BCNF. But in fact, it's not. If you uh, think about it, if you compute F plus, you will infer AC goes to D. That, that's easy to check, right? AB goes to C. As we saw before, from that we can infer AC goes to D. And AC goes to D is actually a subset of ACDE. And now if I compute the closure of AC, it only contains D, not E. Okay, so it's not trivial, it's not a super key. Clearly, AC goes, AC, D, E is not in BCNF. Okay, so I cannot just use the given set of dependencies F. I need to do something more when I, after decomposition, before decomposition, I have given a set on that relation, I just use it as it. After decomposing, I cannot apply that earlier test. One way is to compute F plus and then find the restriction of F plus to uh, R2 and then use that. Uh, doing all that is uh, manually is a bit of a pain. So the other option is uh, to look at every subset here and see if um, 
if it, it it's a functional dependency which holds and uh, but it's not a it's it's not trivial and it's not a super key. So what we do here, that's shown in this test. So th this this is the first thing actually. Test RI with respect to the restriction of F to RI. That is all FDs in F plus that contain only attributes from RI. So first I compute F plus, then see which of those contain attributes only in R. That's a lot of work to compute F plus. The cheaper way is we do the following. If you've got an RI, for every set of attributes alpha subset of RI, compute alpha plus. Using what? Using the original set of dependencies F. I don't have to change that. I'll stick with F. But using F, I compute alpha plus. That's easy. Now, if um, alpha, check that alpha plus either includes no attributes of RI minus alpha. Alpha plus may contain other attributes, but as long as it does not contain any other attributes of Ri other than alpha itself, there's no problem. Or it includes all attributes of Ri. Then it's a super key of Ri. Okay? So it's either trivial with respect to Ri or it's a super key of Ri. So if this holds, then R is, uh, Ri is in BCNF. If it doesn't hold, if it's violated by some alpha goes to beta, then consider this thing. Alpha determines alpha plus minus alpha intersection Ri. So intersection is on this side, okay, the, the, this part. The right hand side is alpha plus minus alpha intersection Ri. This is a functional dependency which can be shown to hold. And we just said that alpha plus does not include all of Ri, so it's not a super key. It's not trivial, it's not a super key, and this is a witness to show that Ri violates BCNF, and we can use this to decompose Ri. Okay, that's the idea. So in this case, um, the, uh, same thing as before. Uh, what is A plus? A plus as AB, and uh, AC plus includes B, say BC, but not D, so it violates BCNF. So that's a witness. AC, AC determines B is the witness. Um, so alpha plus minus alpha. So alpha AC plus is ABC. If you remove AC from that, you're left with B. So AC determines B is a witness. We can use it to decompose it. So finally, this leads us to the BCN of decomposition algorithm, which we can implement. OK. Any questions at this point? We can read this algorithm. So this algorithm says compute F plus, but we can do it more efficiently without computing F plus by uh, the variant which we just showed. Because this particular one does not guarantee dependency preservation. So this is a simple example we saw already. Now take this quiz question Q4. So please compute the BCN of decomposition. So how do we do the decomposition? We first create. A, C, D, and what is left is A, B, C, D minus C, D, which is A, B. So that's the answer, A, B, and A, C, D. Uh, there are more complex examples here, which try to be more realistic. So we have a class, course ID, title, department name, credits. So what is this actually? You see, it's a join of course with a section basically with the classroom. Okay, so it's, come, it's a join of three different relations, all the attributes from that join. And this join result is not in BCNF um, because we have this following functional difference. Course ID determines title, department name, credits. So if I take course ID plus, is it going to determine anything else? We have the uh, original dependency. It's not the course ID is not going to determine uh, section ID, for example. There may be many different sections for a course. So we use this and decompose it. And then, if you take the next one, building room number. Does building room number uh, determine uh, section ID in semester? Of course not. So again, we can use that to decompose and get building room number capacity as one of the relations. And finally, what you will be left with is. Um, the section relation. So if you started with this 
and use these functional dependencies, you will get back the relations that we had in our schema. Now again, the last point here is that it's not always possible to get a dependency preserving BCNF decomposition. And this is an example. Uh, it's a fake example, but the book has another more realistic example. So if I have JKL as a relation with two dependencies, JK goes to L and L goes to K, then it's not in BCNF. Why? L goes to K. L is not a super key. If you decompose it, uh, what will happen? You will get L goes to K and LJ. LK and LJ. That's the only uh, decomposition possible here. The JK goes to L does not violate BCNF. So that is not useful for decomposing. This is the only option you have. Uh, but now that's the only possible decomposition. And does it preserve JK goes to L? Okay, so what have we got? We have okay, if I decompose using L goes to K, I'll get L K and J L. Now what are the dependencies that hold on this? L goes to K is the only one which holds on this. On this, nothing holds. Okay, if you do the closure of this, it's fairly easy to see that J by itself does not determine, well, a J does not determine L. That's the only meaningful thing. L determines J, J determines. Those are only things which could hold. Neither of them holds in this case. Therefore, this is the only one I have, and this does not imply J K goes to L. So this is an example to show that this does not have any meaningful, uh, any dependency preserving BCNF decomposition. So if you were worried about this particular functional dependency, you want to make sure it holds, one option is to not decompose it, let there be redundancy. What is the redundancy? There may be two tuples with the same value of L, and then they will end up having the same value of K. And if an update happens, you have to make sure that both of them have the same value of K, otherwise it becomes inconsistent. Um, but if you want to ensure JK determines L, then you should not decompose it. So that's the motivation for third normal form, that you want to ensure dependency preservation with minimal violation of redundancy. We saw this definition earlier. As a reminder, it's a modification of the BCNF definition by adding this one extra thing. Each attribute A in beta minus alpha is contained in a candidate key. Now, can we apply the BCNF algorithm and modify it slightly to get 3NF? Turns out it's not so simple. Uh, what is possible, however, it's a completely different algorithm, which is actually synthesizes. It's not, it doesn't decompose. It synthesizes a set of relations, which will be in 3NF. And that's, uh, that's a standard algorithm for generating a 3NF decomposition. So here is another semi-realistic example. Uh, department advisor, which says that uh, student ID, instructor ID, department name. That's the relation. The functional dependencies here is that a student may have a multiple major. Right? Student may be in computer science and electronics. So let's say this is possible. So if a student is in CS, there should be an instructor in CS for that student. If the student is also in electronics, there should be an instructor, advisor in electronics for that student. So that's what this models. Uh, so given a student and a department, there should be a unique advisor. There cannot be two advisors. On the other hand, the advisor is in a department. So instructor ID determines department. A person in CS cannot be an advisor for a student for the E department. They can only be advisors for their department. So those are the two dependencies. Um, so now, this is uh, identical to the previous example, abstract example we saw. So if you want BCNF, you will violate dependency. You cannot ensure that a student has, you cannot efficiently check that a student has one advisor per department. However, th this thing is actually in 3NF. 
uh, why is it in 3NF? Well, take the two de uh, dependencies. Um, SID department name determines IID. It's trivially a super key. Okay. Obviously. Another one, ID goes, uh, instructor ID goes to department name. It violates BCNF for sure. But does it violate 3NF? Turns out that the right hand side department name is contained in a candidate key. So the SID department name is a super key. You can also verify that it's not just a super key, it's a candidate key. If I remove department name, it's not a super key. If I remove SID, it's not a super key. It is a candidate key. So this check shows that keeping the relation as is does not violate 3NF. And this relation is fairly intuitive. If I want to track the advisor for a student in a department, I am very likely to keep a table like this. And uh, BCNF is violated, but I still want to keep it. So 3NF allows it. So I may not insist on BCNF, I'd say 3NF is good enough. And the redundancy in 3NF is um, fairly clear here. Um, now, there are two kinds of redundancies. One is, if you take, uh, this is an abstract example, L determines K. There are two tuples with the same L value. The K value has to be the same. That's one kind of redundancy. The other kind of problem is, uh, supposing I keep JKL, and I do not have a separate relation which links instructors to departments. Then, I will have to create a tuple uh, with a null value for j. j is the, in the equivalent example, that was the student ID. Okay? So what is, this is showing is that I'll have to use null values to represent some information, which is uh, ugly. In fact, if you think of it, uh, you take that same example, the student, instructor, and so on. If the only way to uh, link an instructor to a department is through the advisor relation, that's very odd. You wouldn't like that kind of a schema. Okay, that means uh, you have to allow redundancy and null values, both. So what you would end up doing probably is having a instructor department mapping in a separate table, instructor table, and an advisor table redundantly. You wouldn't store null values here. So the same information can be looked up from either table. You can find instructor department. If the instructor is in this table, also you can look it up from that table. Now this actually shows another weird form of redundancy. It is entirely possible for this table to consistently show that Sudarshan is in CS department and that other table, instructor table, to claim Sudarshan is in EE department. If you look at each table separately, it satisfies the functional dependency that instructor determines department. In this table, the only instances of Sudarshan might be with the E department, a student in the E department. Is, uh, I'm advising a student in the E department. In the other table, there's only one tuple for Sudarshan and it says CS department. If you look at each table, it's consistent. It satisfies BCNF, it satisfies 3NF, whatever, it satisfies everything. But there's inconsistency across tables. This is an aspect which these uh, things do not capture. BCNF, 3NF, do not capture this redundancy across tables. Now, if you started with a universal relation and broke it up, this will not happen. There was only one relation, there was no redundancy across tables, only one table, then you broke it down. But if you started with a redundancy, they may not detect it at all. Redundancy across tables may never get detected. So there are limitations to this framework uh, in the context of if you start from ER, you had redundancy in ER, you're going to have redundancy in the tables. How can you have redundancy in ER? Um, so maybe I should uh, answer this thing in the context of aggregates. It's a slight detour, but I think it's worth mentioning. Because somebody was asking, when you've done ER modeling, why should you even check anything afterwards? So let's go back to this. Here is a situation which models aggregation. So we had this uh, instructor, student, project, ternary relationship. Okay. So what does this relationship say? That this instructor is a guide for this student on this project. And you can have more than one instructor being a guide for that student on that project. Now each instructor may give an evaluation of the student. 
and you want to record that. So now, how do you record the evaluation? One way is to, evaluation, let's say, is a, they write a letter or give a grade or whatever, but let's say the evaluation is a document. They have said that something about this person's performance. So let's say that evaluation is an entity itself. So one way to model that is as a uh, quaternary relation between instructor, project, student, evaluation. So we have two relations. One is instructor, project, student, which records which instructor is guiding which student on which project. And when they submit an evaluation, we have one more relation which has a relationship, correspondingly a relation which links instructor, project, student, and the actual evaluation. Now the information in the second table is going to replicate all the information in the first table. It's going to replicate which student is uh, on which project, which, which instructor, and so forth. Okay? So the same information may get replicated in two tables. In one, it may be a subset of it in the other. But the point I'm making is there may be redundancy across tables even after doing ER modeling. Even if you do aggregation, this, this slide was an aggregation. So you could, instead of a quaternary relation, uh, you could have a turn the ternary relation into an entity by aggregation and then relate it to evaluation. This is a cleaner way of doing it. But even if you do this, you may still have redundancy across relations. And the whole theory which we are looking at does not capture this. Okay, so now uh, what I'm going to look at is the how to generate a 3NF uh, decomposition of a relation using the synthesis algorithm. So this part has two steps. The first step is to define a notion of a canonical cover, which is a minimal set. So this is the opposite of F plus. What is F plus? It's everything which you can derive. Canonical cover is the other way. Can we strip down what we are given so we have a minimal set of dependencies, which is equivalent to the given set of dependencies? This is the first step. And now from this minimal set of dependencies, we generate a set of relations. Now, if we did the same generation of relations from the given set of dependencies, there may be uh, redundancy across relations. But if you minimize it, you're removing that redundancy. So 3NF synthesis first minimizes and uh, then generates a set of relations. So what do we mean by minimizing? We want a set of dependencies, which is equivalent in the sense that their F plus is the same, but it's minimal. What do we mean by minimal? It could be minimal because we throw away some dependency. It's not needed at all. But minimality may not only be in this sense. It may be even in the sense that we can strip out some attributes from a dependency, either the left-hand side or right-hand side. So it becomes smaller. So we can minimize by throwing out dependencies, or we can take something and shrink it by removing attributes. What is important is when we do any of these, remove attributes from anywhere to make it smaller, the result should be equivalent. So we can only throw out or strip out attributes if the result is equivalent. And we keep doing it as long as the result is equivalent. So how do you determine if it is OK to strip an attribute while keeping equivalence? That's the idea. So a canonical cover is this minimal thing. So to show the examples of redundancy, a, B goes to, a goes to B, B goes to C, A goes to C. We know A goes to C is redundant. If we throw it out, we can derive it back. But you may also have other kinds of redundancy. Take this one. A, B, B, C, and A, C, D. Can you throw out A, C, D? You can't. Because then you cannot derive A, D. Can you throw out A, B? No. B, C? No. However, we can throw out C from this one. Throw out C from the right-hand side. We are uh, weakening it, right? Earlier we said A determines C, D. The decomposition rule, rule actually says that a determines C and A determines D. We can replace it and then throw out A determines C because it is derived. Okay, so you can think of it that way. Or you can think of it as just removing C from this side. It's always fine to remove it. You know, it's not incorrect, but you might lose information. So in this case, we don't lose information because we can derive it back from the remaining ones. So that is a redundant attribute on the right-hand side. Now take this other example, A, B, B, C. AC goes to D. 
in this case, um, we can delete C from the left hand side here. From AC, we can delete C. Now, in general, you can't do this. If you r remove C from AC, you're getting a stronger functional dependency. AC goes to D does not mean A goes to D. So we cannot just remove arbitrarily from the left hand side. However, if the remaining functional dependencies along with this implies that A goes to D, then we can remove it. That's the idea. Uh, so in this case, um, A goes to B, B goes to C, therefore A goes to C. Using A goes to C and AC goes to D, we can derive A goes to D. So now we can add that to the set uh, tem temporarily, A, B to, A to B, B to C, A to D, and A to AC to D. Now between A goes to D and AC goes to D, you can easily derive A C goes to D from A goes to D. How do you do that? You're just adding an attribute to the left hand side. It's implied. Right? So you can throw that other one away. It's no longer needed. Because uh, this stronger one implies that, we can throw that original one away. This is the idea. So before stripping from the right hand side, we'll make sure that um, the weakened form still implies all the original ones. Before throwing away from the left hand side, we will make sure that the original set implies the strengthened form. Those are the two steps. So that's the basic idea of uh, extraneous attributes. So given a set f of functional dependencies and a particular functional dependency, alpha goes to beta in f, we'll say that a is extraneous in f if, first of all, a is in alpha, it's on the left hand side, and f logically implies f minus this one union the strengthened one. So we're taking out the weakened one and adding the strengthened one, uh, alpha minus a goes to beta. If this is implied by the original set of dependencies f, then we can remove that attribute from alpha and keep the resultant functional dependency in the set. That's the idea. Is this clear from the previous example? And similarly, um, extraneous on the other side, the test goes the other way. Instead of seeing if f implies this, we are going to see if the weakened functional dependency, what is the weakened set? From f we remove alpha goes to beta and add back the weakened one, alpha goes to beta minus a. If the weakened set implies f, then they are equivalent. So then um, a is extraneous in beta. So those are the two things which you have to check. So we can actually just, um, well, the implication in the other direction is trivial. I said equivalence, right? So weakened form is obviously implied by the stronger form. So we don't have to explicitly check for that. Here's an example once again. Um, a goes to C, A, B goes to C. Um, now is B extraneous here? Because the original set if we drop B, what, is, what do we get? A goes to C. But if you take the original set, it already has A goes to C. Okay, so B is extraneous. So what do you get after that? You delete B, you get AC and AC. Two copies of the same thing, you just keep one copy, A goes to C. And in hindsight, that is obvious. Uh, this is a weaker form of this. But what we did is we just applied the algorithm blindly and we got to the same result. Another example, A goes to C, A, B goes to C, D. Now we can't uh, drop it like that. However, C is extraneous on the right hand side because it can be derived from A goes to C. So we drop it, we'll get um, A, B goes to C and A goes to C. Uh, A, B goes to D rather. A, B goes to D and A goes to C. And what we do eventually is apply this fairly straightforward algorithm Check if each attribute is extraneous by using attribute closure, strip it down, get a minimal set. And it's very efficient. It's not hard to do it by hand, actually. And we can do all this and come up with a minimal set of dependencies, which is called the canonical cover. Okay? So if logically implies everything in FC, 
and FC logically implies everything in F, that is their equivalent. And nothing in FC has an extraneous attribute. So we keep deleting extraneous attributes till nothing more can be deleted. And furthermore, each left side is unique. In other words, what we do is if you have two things with the same left side, we'll union them. That's the one extra step. So that is the canonical cover. And come back to the 3NF algorithm. So the goal was minimize. Now the 3NF algorithm does one more step. It says, take the canonical cover, FC, and do the following. Step through each dependency alpha goes to beta in the canonical cover. If none of the existing schemas contains alpha goes to beta, then create a new relation with alpha beta. Now this step, uh, you know, so we take that uh, case where we had instructor department, student instructor department. Student instructor department would be created maybe, it minimal. If we also have instructor department, then it's contained in the other one. So you may have a canonical cover where um, one of the relations is contained in the other. So you may skip that. And that's what this step does. And finally, if none of the schemas, so you just create, essentially you create one relation containing all the attributes of one functional dependency and do this for all the functional dependencies. You may remove some redundant relations. And one last step. It's possible after all this that there's no candidate key contained in any of the relations. Why? There may be some attributes which were not determined at all by anything. Okay, so it's uh, possible that none of the schemas contains a candidate key for R, in which case pick any candidate key and make that a relation by itself. So these are the set of relations that you create. Like I said, optionally remove redundant relations. So you get a set of relations, one per functional dependency, and maybe one more for the candidate key. It's, we, here it's called the decomposition algorithm, but it's also called the 3NF synthesis algorithm because it's not doing stepwise decomposition. It's taking a relation and giving you a decomposition straight by working the other way. And in fact, this algorithm not only ensures in 3NF, it's dependency preserving and lossless join. Dependency preserving should be obvious, right? Why? Yeah, every functional dependency has a corresponding relation, unless it's contained in another relation, when, in which case it can be checked there. So it's very easy to see it's dependency preserving. Uh, is it lossless join? It is, you can prove it essentially. Uh, there's a proof in the, it's either in the book or in the solutions, uh, there's maybe an exercise. I think it's in the book itself, so you can go read it up. The, the question always comes up, what should you choose? Should you choose BCNF, should you choose 3NF? A uh, gate question which has been asked many times is, uh, assumes that the ideal form is 3NF. Is it ideal? I don't know. I think that's a design decision. Uh, is dependency preservation very important? Maybe it is. Or maybe it's not. And redundancy is more important. So I think that's a decision which is, uh, there's no single solution. I cannot say do this or do that. Uh, that's up to the designer, and uh, we we'll, should leave that at that. We cannot say one is the ideal form. You can, you can choose whichever depending on your needs. So let me take a quick check. How many of you cover multi-value dependencies in your course? Hmm? Up to fifth normal form, all the normal forms. Okay. So many don't. So what I would say is multi-value dependencies are something which we should cover because it's a very natural thing. Do you go beyond multi-value dependencies? That's up to you. Uh, the no higher normal forms are hard to deal with. But multi-value dependencies are practical and you should cover them. So what is a multi-value dependency? Um, it's basically something which says, so here is a um, situation where we have an instructor child, which maps the instructor to the child. And instructor phone, which maps instructor to phone number. Now, of course, an instructor may have more than one child, assuming it's not China, which enforces the one-child policy, even though they have exceptions. And uh, in India, of course, there are many children, unfortunately. Uh, and then instructor phone, and certainly everybody today has more than one phone. You know, there's a home phone, there's an office phone, there's a mobile phone, there's a mobile phone with dual SIM, there are two mobile phones. Okay, so a lot of phones. 
So you can represent it using these two relations, no problem. Have multiple tuples in there. What if I join these two relations to get ID, child name, phone number? What functional dependencies hold on this? Does any functional dependency hold on this? Does ID determine child name? No. ID determine phone? No. Um, child determine phone? Of, of course not. Phone determines ID? Not necessarily, because it would be a shared phone. Phone determines child? Of course not. So there is no functional dependency on this schema. Therefore, is it in BCNF? Yes. There's no functional dependency. It's trivially in BCNF. Is it in 3NF? Sure, it is in 3NF. Does it make sense to store this relation like this? No. We got this by doing a join of those two. You can see there's a lot of redundancy here. The point to note here is there is no relationship between the child name and the phone number. Now, there may be a situation where the instructor reserves this phone number to be used by this child and that other phone number should only be used by that other child. Okay, this is a weird example, but supposing you wanted to record this kind of information, then maybe it's useful to keep this table. But the point here is that that's meaningless. And in terms of multi-value dependencies, what we are going to say is that the relationship between the instructor and the child name is independent of everything else in this table. If you take the join table, if you started with that, the relationship of ID to child name is independent of anything else in the table. And in fact, the relationship of ID to phone number is also independent of everything else in that table. It's not functionally determined, but it's an independence. That's the basic idea, it's independent. So we're going to write a multi-value dependency by a double arrow like this. And we'll say that ID multi-value determines phone number, which does not functionally determine, but it multi-value determines. And um, a multi-value uh, dependency, in fact, a functional dependency implies a multi-value dependency, but not the other way. Okay, we'll see that. Uh, may not have time for it, but that's a basic property. So now, we're going to have a set of functional dependencies and a set of multi-value dependencies. And we have to normalize taking all of these into account. And there, is, there are extensions of the earlier things for multi-value dependencies. In particular, um, there's something called fourth normal form, which is uh, stronger than BCNF, in the sense that BCNF only considers functional dependencies. 4NF considers functional dependencies and multi-value dependencies and removes redundancy. So if you apply BCNF, this particular schema, you can show, uh, if you apply 4NF rather. If you apply BCNF, it is in BCNF. If you apply fourth normal form, you can show that this schema is not in fourth normal form. Therefore, it is a bad design. And this schema, on the other hand, is in fourth normal form. Moreover, what is interesting is that um, if you assert that child name is independent of ID and phone number is, uh, sorry, is independent of phone number, uh, then if you have this situation, David and William are the two children, and these two phone numbers, 1, 2, 3, 4, 4, 3, 2, 1 are the two phone numbers. If you had David, 1, 2, 3, 4, and William, 4, 3, 2, 1, you must also have David, 4, 3, 2, 1, and William, 1, 2, 3, 4. If you only had the first and the fourth tuple, you're implying that that child is somehow connected with this phone number, which is not true. We just stated that the uh, child is determined independent of the phone number. Therefore, you cannot have just those two tuples. You must have the other two tuples also. So multi-value dependency says that if you have these two tuples, you must also have those other two tuples. Otherwise, there would be an erroneous implication that this child is linked to this phone number. That's the intuition. Um, and the point is that now, given that these two tuples must exist, the decomposition is lossless join. Because if we decompose like this, and then join back, we will get all four tuples. Because in the decomposition, there is no connection of child to phone. So when you join back, we will get all four tuples back. So if we started with only two tuples and got four, there is a problem. The multi-value dependency says you cannot have only these two, you must have the other two also. That's the idea. 
So I don't have uh, slides, ex more slides on multi-value dependency given the lack of time. So uh, we will stop here.